Hey, AP Stat students, I know it's going to be a really busy week for a lot of you with all your AP tests starting. Here's what we're going to do this week. Our last unit we're covering this week, I'm going to try to break it up into something small every day rather than two video, two really long videos. Then you can kind of choose. Hopefully you'll keep track every day, but if you need to, you can watch a video here, a video there, so on and so forth. So today we're going to go through the one sample T interval for mu as well as the match pairs. I'm going to just briefly talk about it. Tomorrow we'll do the one sample T test for mu. Uh, the next day, okay, we're going to do the two sample T interval for mu1 minus mu2. And then we're gonna, the last day we'll do the two sample T test for mu1 minus mu2. And then on Friday, hopefully we can arrange a time to do a Google Meet. I know you guys are all so busy, but just to get prepped. OK, and then really the following week is just little bits of review here and there. You guys have been amazing. This is our last week of just reviewing the concepts. Um, let's get going, you guys, and just smile. We're almost done. So a one sample T interval from you. This comes right from the College Board, this problem. So let's get going. Move this down here. An environmental group conducted a study to, to determine whether crows in a certain region were ingesting food containing unhealthy levels of lead. A biologist classified lead levels greater than 6.0 parts per million ppm as unhealthy. The lead levels of a random sample of 23 crows in the region were measured and recorded. The data shows, uh, the data are shown in the stamp plot below. Okay, so you see right here, what we have is we have our stem plot and then we have our key. So two line eight means 2.8 ppm. Okay, so the next question says, what proportion of crows in the sample had lead levels that are classified by the biologist as unhealthy? We're not gonna do that one. I can quickly talk about it if you want. Any lead levels greater than 6.0 are unhealthy. So really this question is just getting at, can you read a stem plot? And this is actually a split stem, just as a friendly reminder. A split stem would be where it's broken, it's going by fives, right? So this row right here is gonna have anything with decimals from zero to four, where this row has any decimals from five to nine. And it's just making sure that you can understand how to read a stem plot and you know what a proportion is. Sorry, my hair is, my little flyaways are itching me on my hair. Okay, so I'm gonna skip that right now. I'm gonna get to part B. The mean lead level of 23 crows in the sample was 4.90 ppm with a standard deviation of 1.12. Construct and interpret a 95% confidence interval for the mean lead levels of crows in the region. Again, I want to just quickly address a common question. And I've said, if you've been watching my videos, you know I've said this almost every time. Students will say, how do I know when to do an interval versus when to do a test? Fair question read the question. It will state implicitly, construct a confidence interval. If it's just asking for, do we have significant evidence or do we have evidence and they don't say interval in there, you are doing a test. You're doing ZOMS or TOMS. Okay, let's get going to the state plan do conclude. State, with an interval, you state the parameter. That's what's describing the population, okay? We are not doing proportions anymore. How do we know if we're doing a proportion, a Z versus a T? A proportion is for categorical variable, okay? That means we're doing a Z. A mean is for quantitative variables. That means we're dealing with a T, and oftentimes you'll see somewhere in there where it will say something about a mean, where they tell us right here, the mean lead level, we're doing a T, okay? So if they're gonna say mean, we're gonna use a mu, not P. State mu, mu equals the true mean lead levels of crows in the region. How would this change if the problem was different? For the state, for an interval, when we're dealing with a T, you're always going to say mu is equal to the true mean, and then you're going to fill in the blank here. What's the question about? Okay. Next, we're going to go with the plan. Okay. Now, if I'm, I'm trying to talk slow, I'm talking fast in these videos. I know I'm trying to talk a little bit slower. Make sure you guys are pausing, rewinding, so on and so forth. 
and feel free to email me with any feedback that you might have. Okay, the plan, we're gonna run, we're going on a run. Do we have a random sample? And I believe it's stated in here that we have a random sample of 23 crows. So we're gonna put that right there. I, that's still your 10 times N has to be less than capital N. You should have that down in your notes already. 10 times 23 has to be less than all crows in the region, really, I shouldn't have put. So 10, I'm using my cursor here, so forgive me, times little n, our sample size, has to be less than our population size. That's our independence right there, okay? Then finally, our n, this is where some people make mistakes. We're not doing a proportion, so we are not doing np is greater than or equal to 10, and n times one minus p is greater than or equal to 10. We are doing that n has to be greater than or equal to 30. Where does that 30 come from? That 30 comes from the central limit theorem. And I have a video I'll post over that later. We don't need to worry about that now, but you do need to know that 30 comes from that central limit theorem, okay? Now, if it would state in the problem that this sample comes from a normal population, it doesn't matter the sample size, you just state stated normal population in the problem, okay? It doesn't state that here though, and we do have an issue. 23 is not greater than or equal to 30. So what happens when something's not greater than or equal to 30? You have to graph it. And I am guessing, I'm putting my money on it, that the AP is going to give you a graph, either a box plot or a stem and leaf plot or a histogram, something just like they did in this problem because they really wanna know essentially that you really know the big picture and not just a little graph. Now, that doesn't mean they're not gonna have you graph, okay? They may have you part A graph, and then down in part C, right, you're running a test. I don't know, because the year 2020 is a weird one, okay? And we're all, we're all doing our best here to kind of like guess what one problem will be, because it's only two questions, right? So it could be all connected where you do have to graph it but you would have graphed it in, graph in part A and described it maybe using socks. So again, because reviewing for a test is a marathon, not a sprint, let's just quickly look at this. If we graph this and they ask to describe it, remember, shape, outlier, center, spread. Do not put S bullet, symmetric, O bullet, none. Talk about it in context. The shape of the lead levels in crows is symmetric, right? Take that away. Okay, with no apparent outliers, the center seems to be around, you know, anywhere from 4.6 to 5.9, okay? The spread right now goes from 6.8 to 2.8. We subtract that, that's 4.0, that's our range. That's just a general definition. Okay, we just rewound to review a little bit because that's important. Now let's go back to that interval. So we stated, right? We are running. Now, 23 is greater than is not greater than or equal to 30. We should graph it. We've already graphed it or you are given the graph. The graph is symmetric with no outliers. What do you need? Remember in class, we talked about a medium sample versus a small sample. If the sample's anywhere between 15 and 30, that's considered a medium sample. We don't say that on the test like it's a medium sample. But what that means is if there's some skew, that's okay. There just can't be any outliers. And then anything less than 15, that's considered a small sample. And you really want that to be mostly symmetric. Again, no outliers. We're perfect here. This is really symmetric with no outliers. So we have to state that here. The graph above is symmetric with no outliers. Okay, quick recap because I brought some review in there. For this problem, for an interval, the plan, you need an R, random. I, independence, 10N is less than capital N. And then you need that normal condition N, your sample size has to be greater than or equal to 30. If it's not, you have to graph it, okay? Or talk about the graph that's already shown or that you've already done. It needs to be either somewhat skewed or symmetric with no outliers. And then finally, for that method, you need 
a one sample T interval for mu. <sighs> now we're at the do, okay? If we go to our formula sheets, okay? Remember, this is my favorite page. In our formula sheet, a confidence interval, we get our statistics. So what statistic are we dealing with here? We are dealing with an X bar, a mean, okay? So let's go to that right now. Oh, oh no, what's going on? I can't get to it. Here we go, good. Our X bar, our X bar they tell us was 4.90. So I'm just gonna put 4.9 because we don't need that 4.90. Okay, now we go to our critical value. So since we're dealing with a T, it's now a T star, okay? Friendly reminder for a T star, you need your degrees of freedom. Oh, my handwriting is so terrible with this, you guys. Degrees of freedom is N minus one. So in this case, we have an N of 23, so 23 minus one is 22. So right now, let me show you how to get that T star, okay? So I had my statistic, that critical value, we're dealing with a T, not a Z, okay? Z is for proportions. T star, our critical value, we get it with our degrees of freedom. So we scroll down to table B, okay? infinite right there, that is your Z stars. Here are our T stars when we're dealing with our degrees of freedom. Our, oh gosh, what was it? Sorry guys. Our degrees of freedom are 22. I already forgot it. That was 23. I just want to make sure I did it right for you guys. 22. I go to the 22. Let's make this a little bigger. Okay. I go to 22. That's right here. I go to 95% right here. It intersects right there at 2.074, okay? 2.074. So plus or minus 2.074, okay? Now I'm going to go back to my formula sheet. I'm going to go back to my favorite page. I see I have my statistic, whoops, went a little too fast. I have my statistic, my X bar, plus or minus my T star, right? Times the standard deviation of the statistic. Now this time it's technically the standard error, but that's okay because we're estimating what it is based off that standard deviation of the sample. We say to ourselves, is it a single sample or is it a two sample? We have a one sample, a single sample. We're dealing with a mean, so my formula is right here okay so i'm gonna go i'm gonna hit down i take my standard deviation that they gave me divided by the square root of n times oops the standard deviation they gave me was 1.12 divided by the square root of n and n is equal to 23. Now, if you have, if you don't have a graphing calculator, you're gonna have to calculate this by hand. So you would take 4.9 minus, this is my margin of error right here, this part, minus my margin of error, and 4.9 plus my margin of error. But if we have our graphing calculator, we can become one with that graphing calculator and plug it in there. Friendly reminder though, guys, you must show work. Many of you, as you're submitting your problems, you're just giving me a lower bound and an upper bound. That's not good enough, you guys. We're striving for a five. We're showing our work. We're taking our time, keeping conscious of how much time we're taking, but showing that work and really knowing our stuff. So let's go to the graphing calculator. I'm going to go to stat. I'm going to arrow over to tests, and I'm doing a T interval, and that's number eight. So I can just hit eight. I do not have data. What is data? Data is where you have a list of numbers that you had to put into L1. Just a friendly reminder how you get to L1, stat, edit, and you would put that list in L1. 
but that's not the list we care about right now. We have statistics. They gave us a mean, they gave us a standard deviation. So I'm gonna go back to T interval. I'm gonna go to stats. I'm gonna hit enter. I have a statistic there, my mean of 4.9. Wait a second. I have a standard deviation right here of 1.12. And I have a sample size of 23. And I'm calculating a 95% confidence interval, so 0.95. And now this is so fancy, I love it. I am going to um, pull this here, give me a second. I'm gonna X this out. I need to make it smaller. Okay, so there's my interval, you guys. That's my lower bound, that's my upper bound. And that gives us plausible values for the truth about the population, okay? And we're 95% confident in that. Friendly reminder, watch the videos from last week. What does a confidence level mean? Interpret it. What is a p-value? That was all in those um, videos last week. I'm not going to re-go through that. So what am I going to do? I'm going to write those values down in my do part. I'm a 5.3843. Okay. And then we get to our statement. I am 95% confident that the interval from 4.157 to 5.3843 contains the true mean lead levels of pros in the region. Okay, what's gonna change? This may change on you. It could be a different percentage. These will definitely change on you. Contains the true mean and then context. What is the context? We did it. We did a one sample T interval for mu. The one thing I want to quickly just chat about is a matched pairs experiment. Okay. Whoops, wrong one. And that's right here. Um, I just want to talk about, you know, what do you do and what changes and really not a whole lot changes. Okay. So let's read through it. I'm not going to go through the whole problem. I'm just going to talk about what changes right now. Okay. A researcher believes that trading seeds with certain additives before planting can enhance the growth of plants. An experiment to investigate this is conducted in a greenhouse from a large number of Roma tomato seeds. 24 seeds are randomly chosen and two are assigned to each of 12 containers. One of the two seeds is randomly selected and treated with the additive. The other seed serves as a control. Both seeds are then planted in the same container. The growth in centimeters of each of the 24 plants is measured after 30 days. These data were used to generate the, par uh, the partial computer output shown below. Graphical displays indicate the assumption of normality is not unreasonable. What that means is when we graphed the difference, it was symmetric enough. So they're stating that so you can state that in your conditions. I need to pause real quick. I'll be right back. You shouldn't see anything different in the video. Okay, sorry, my daughter came in, so I had to pause for a second. So we're going to construct a confidence interval for the mean difference in growth in centimeters of the plants from the untreated and treated seeds. Be sure to interpret this interval. All that means is go through everything. It doesn't say interpret the level, so you want to be really clear about that. I really believe it would say interpret the level in like a part B or a part C. Interpreting the interval is just the conclude. So that's really important to note. Okay. So I'm going to just talk through some of it. I'll write down some of it. The state now. Okay. That would be the true mean difference in growth in centimeters of the plants from the untreated and treated seeds. Often the state will come right from the problem. You can you can get the word right there if you're struggling with context. Okay, state done, check. Now we're on to the plan. We're gonna RIN. The big thing here though is it is an experiment. Okay, so what is going on? What we have is the 12 containers are actually what's being sampled and they're getting 
both treatments, right? There's 24 seeds. They're getting one with the additive and one without the additive, okay? Um, because that was the control. So what you would say is you would say random assignment, right, of the 24 seeds, okay, means that the individuals are independent, right? The containers are independent, as well as the groups are independent of each other, okay? So you don't go and say a randomly whatever, because it's saying those 24 seeds are randomly put into those 12 pots based off if it's an additive or not. So again, when it's an experiment, random assignment means those groups are independent of each other as well as each container, what happens there is independent of each other. I talked about this last week more in depth. Let me know if you have any more questions, okay? And then you do have to say the sample size is greater than or equal to 30. Well, the sample size is 12. Why is the sample size 12? Because we're looking at 12 containers and we're looking at the difference in those 12 containers. So that's right here. That is not greater than or equal to 30. That 30 friendly reminder comes from the central limit theorem. So we need to graph it. Well, we don't have the data to graph it, but they state in there that it does say normality. So you would have to state 12 is not greater than or equal to 30, but it is stated that there is a, an assumption of normality that is not unreasonable, okay? We just rinned. Now we have a one sample T interval for matched pairs. Again, how do I know it's matched pairs? Those containers, they got both treatments. All right, moving on. Then we would go on to the do. We have our mean, so I'll write this part down. Negative 2.015 plus or minus, okay? plus or minus the T star. So I'm doing a degrees of freedom of 11. It wants a, what, 95% confidence interval? Does it say? Oh dear. It does not state. Okay, so we're gonna just assume that if it doesn't state, we're gonna assume that we're gonna go to, whoopsie. Um, we're gonna assume we're gonna go to 95%. 95% confidence with 11 degrees of freedom. We're going to table B. 11 is right here, right? 95% is right here, 2.201. Oh, sorry, guys, my computer's being funny. 2.201 times the standard deviation 1.163 divided by the square root of 12. That's the work you have to show. Now, I'm going to go to my calculator. I'm going to go plug this in because I want to talk about part B. That's the most important part here, in my opinion, okay, other than the match pairs part of it. T intervals 8. Now again, if you don't have a calculator, a graphing calculator, you're gonna have to graph or calculate this by hand. So my mean is 2.015 and that's a negative. So negative, wah, negative 2.015. I don't care about the T star. I care about the standard deviation, which is 1.163. I have my standard or my sample size of 12 and a confidence level of 95%. I'm gonna hit enter and there we go. My fanciness, I love that part. Okay, so that concludes, that would be, I am 95% confidence, right? That the true mean difference in growth in centimeters of the plants from the untreated and treated seeds is contained in the interval from negative 2.754 to negative 1.276, okay? Or I am 95% confident that the interval from negative 2.754 to negative 1.276 contains blah, 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 right there, okay? I like that blah, blah, blah. Um, what I really wanna talk about is just that follow-up question there, and that is, 
based on the confidence interval in part A, is there sufficient evidence to conclude there's a significant mean difference in growth of the plants from untreated seeds and the plants from treated seeds? Justify your conclusion. What you're stating here is they're just asking you that follow-up question of, hey, can you interpret that zero is not in the interval, okay? If zero is not in the interval, you have evidence that there's a difference. Now, what is AP looking for? AP is looking for that you can state that, hey, we don't have sufficient evidence. Use their words, you guys, to help you with the context. We don't have sufficient evidence to conclude that there's, rewind, I'm sorry. We do have sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a significant mean difference in growth of plants from untreated seeds and the plants from treat, treated seeds. So we do have sufficient evidence. Why? Because zero is not in our 95% confidence interval. So that's what the College Board is looking for. And I will type that out because I, so, I know some of you and I know you're going to want that. Forgive me, I got ahead of myself. Our last one is we didn't have sufficient evidence last week. So I was just getting ahead of myself here. So I'm going to type that out for you guys. Okay, so I'm going to say um, there is sufficient evidence to conclude that there is a significant mean difference in growth of the plants from untreated and the plants from treated seeds because zero is in my 95% is not, I'm sorry, ugh, I'm botching it. Zero is not in that interval. If zero is not in that interval, that means there's not a, well, there's a tiny chance, I guess, based on this, but um, if zero was in the interval, that means there's a chance that there's no difference. Because zero is not in the interval, we have sufficient evidence that there's a difference, okay? Sorry, guys, it's getting late right now. I've been work working overtime, um, which is okay, because I love it, but, and I get ahead of myself sometimes. So just a quick review on this one. Why is it a matched pairs? It's a matched pairs because they got both treatments. So we only care about the differences, okay? Um, we talked about how to plug that into the interval. And then finally, that follow-up question, do you have evidence that there's a difference? The big thing is, just to remember, if you have, if you have evidence there's a difference, zero cannot be in the interval. And zero was not in our interval. And the big thing the College Board is gonna look for is you need to say, Zero is not in my 95% confidence interval. The same goes for if you did, like, if you had no evidence, because zero is in my 95% confidence interval. Forgive me, like I said, it's late. Uh, I've been working overtime, it feels like, which is okay. Um, I love teaching and I miss you guys so much. And I hope all is well and good luck with all your AP tests this week. Um, I know you guys can do it with positive attitude, lots of sleep, and just um, hanging in there, you guys. Eat a good breakfast, good lunch, so on and so forth. Take care.